But before we open our discussion, um, we have our fifth speaker today, and that's my friend Simon Sellars. Simon's based in Melbourne. He's the editor of Architectural Review Australia. He's written widely on travel, urbanism, architecture and film. For a decade, he worked as a writer for Lonely Planet, and he contributed chapters to lots of books and wrote The Lonely Planet Guide to Micronations, which is the guide to homemade nations. He's the publisher of um, the website Ballardian about the work of novelist J.G. Ballard and is currently working on a couple of um, Ballard-related books due for publication next year. And he's here in Christchurch um, to write about the reconstruction of the city for his magazine, Architectural Review. So welcome, Simon. Uh, thank you. Um, this is actually my uh, first time in Christchurch, and um, my first experience of the CBD was a tour that um, Hugh gave me through the Red Zone the other day, so that was um, quite a, a strange experience in itself. But, um, uh, but anyway, it's great to be here, and I've really enjoyed um, talking to people about uh, the experience of the earthquake. It's um, obviously still something that's quite powerful. Um, so we're here to talk about the sort of role of um, art in the reconstruction of the city, um, and because I'm very bad at self-editing, I'm just going to put forth a series of images that will hopefully coalesce like a sort of collage. Um, uh, I'm kind of being flippant, but not really, because I think sometimes a collage effect is, is kind of necessary in this sort of thing, so drawing images from past, present and future, because everyone has a, a, a memory of what Christchurch was like before the earthquake, and everyone has a, a sort of an idea of what it will be like in the future, and all these things sort of coalesce together. So I hope to sort of touch on that. Um, my background is in cultural studies, so um, I used to work as an academic, um, and as Lara mentioned, I um, studied the work of the novelist J.G. Ballard. Um, he writes a lot about city environments, and from there I sort of became interested in um, urbanism and architecture and the sort of role of the sort of creative imagination in um, reimagining cityscapes. Um, and I'm beginning with this quote from uh, Kenneth Frampton, the architecture critic, who says, the architect must become an urban gorilla, an inventor of new strategies, and a steed amid, amid the uh, ruins, an agent provocateur. Um, so I guess in the uh, arguing for art, I'm also arguing for ar architects as, a, for, as a, a kind of art form, but with a specific um, social function, and I think it's uh, a, and a civic function as well. And I think it's great that we have the involvement of um, people with architecture backgrounds on this panel. Um, so yeah, I just want to start with an image from Melbourne, where I'm from, and this is the uh, Docklands development in Melbourne. And I want to just give an example of what um, a sort of development that can happen with no sort of creative uh, or art artistic input. Uh, so it's Melbourne Docklands, or Shocklands, as I like to call it. Um, and um, I think this is a, a sort of a example of planning that doesn't really work at the sort of social interaction level. You have these tall apartment buildings that create this sort of wind tunnel effect, so it's quite sort of abrasive in the sort of uh, social interaction on street level. Um, and the only sort of artistic concession, or indeed the only sort of concession to the, the previous working class history of the Docklands is these sort of apartment buildings that you can see there that are shaped like the prowls of ships. Um, and that's about it. And then at the, uh, the back of this um, development is uh, the Harbour Town Shopping Precinct, which is um, three levels of shops that um, have no customers. You know, they've sort of staked their, their utopian future on this um, uh, retail, retail um, utopia. So there's a... I did a walk around there recently and I saw these bored shopkeepers slumped over their counters waiting for the customers that never arrived. Um, and it re reminded me of those uh, giant mega malls in, in China, that these sort of mega malls almost the uh, size of cities that have um, um, come up around these sort of new town developments in China. Um, and it was interesting that um, there was a 48-hour design competition recently in the Docklands. Um, and so they got these... Uh, artists and architects and designers to come in and create temporary artworks and installations. And what they did was they sort of came in and they sort of um, worked with the corruption in the, the initial design of this um, environment. So, for example, they made kinetic sculptures in the sort of wind tunnels between these buildings um, and created things that really sort of made you think about the, the flaws in the design and made you think about it in a new way and sort of inspired a sort of imaginative response to that. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, and I want to contrast that with, uh, with Rotterdam, which also redeveloped its uh, waterfront. But what they did, instead of raising all the old maritime buildings to the ground, as, I, as happened in Melbourne, is um, 
kept some of them um, and before the sort of residential moved in, leased them to artists and artistic communities and created this sort of program of um, uh, a community interaction through, through art forms. Um, and I think there was a sort of nascent theatre company that moved into one of these buildings, was quite small at the time, became quite well known and started drawing down, people down to the waterfront um, in Rotterdam. Uh, so created a sort of, um, created a place of um, inspiration, of entertainment, uh, a, a space for people to talk about as well, you know, because everyone has an opinion on whether art is good or, or bad. Um, so created that sort of social program at the sort of ground level, this sort of emergent bottom-up community based around a, a creative mindset. Um, and in Australia, um, Renew Newcastle was, uh, is a kind of similar se- a scheme that the uh, guy who started that, uh, Marcus Westbury, admitted that he was obsessed with ruins and decay. He was obsessed with the abandoned buildings of uh, Newcastle, um, but what he did was something similar to Rotterdam. So he got all these old uh, buildings <coughs> um, and leased it and got um, the people who owned them instead of destroying them or redeveloping them to lease them to art- artistic communities um, and uh, communities working in, in social welfare and things like that. And and sort of sort of grew this sort of community to uh, revitalise Newcastle in um, quite a successful way. <coughs> Um, and related that to that sort of uh, thing that Marcus said about his obsession with ruins and decay, I think that um, the other extreme that, of that is um, the aestheticisation of ruins that you can find in a lot of um, a lot of um, films, for example, a lot of science fiction films, a lot of artworks. Um, goes back to the you know the sort of history of the sublime in art of staring into the ruins and, and finding some sort of transcendental um, way to to work out the, the trauma and the emotion of the wreckage. Um, and uh, so that history of sublime, I think we could call it, um, to use a crude 21st century vernacular, ruins porn today. Um, and that's most uh, clearly um, evident in a place like Detroit, which is, uh, be, you know, it's lost its industry, it's lost its sort of um, capital, capitalist engine and has been allowed to completely run down. Um, and you can get on the internet and find all, all manner of websites and photographers uh, taking these high-definition photos of Detroit, of the ruined buildings of Detroit, um, in these hyper-vivid, hyper-realistic uh, uh, hyper, um, colours. So, um, you know, it's this total aestheticisation of the ruins. Um, I think that's the other extreme of uh, something like what Marcus Westby did in Newcastle. Um, so how does this relate to art and uh, Christchurch? Um, well, I think that... Um, that impulse is, is, I think, that any sort of uh, public art that um, comes into Christchurch, I think, must uh, have elements of this. Um, I think that the temptation in urban planning uh, would, would probably... I'm not an urban planner, so I can't say for sure, but I think the temptation would probably be in a post-traumatic situation to, uh, to want to manage everything right down to the most minute level. And I think that um, the point was made yesterday in the panel that there must be a certain amount of anarchy and spontaneity in that sort of reconstruction efforts to uh, inspire people's imaginations. Um, this, and there's a lot of uh, sort of utopian talk in um, urban planning, and I don't really mean that in the pejorative sense, but, you know, you must look to the future and you must look to how um, best to re- reconstruct a city. Um, but I'm also interested in the sort of dystopian underside of that. So a sort of, um, I guess, what you could call a, a dystopian imagination or a productive dystopian imagination. Um, so something that can look at a sort of ironic detach, a t- a detachment at ruins um, and use that as a way to, to sort of um, build a bridge to, I guess, a possible utopia. Um, and someone, I, I can't remember, but someone made the point yesterday also about ruins as um, being incorporated into uh, public art in the sort of post-earthquake uh, situation here in Christchurch. And I think that's an interesting idea. Um, <coughs> I kind of think of urban design as like directing a film. Um, you know, the best films will work on a sensory level. For example, a suspense thriller um, that works on suspense and atmosphere rather than blood and gore. Um, films that don't tell an audience how to feel but allow them to fill in some of the gaps themselves. And I think that um, cities must have that element of chance uh, of play incorporated into them. I think play is a kind of important <laughs> word. Um, and, of course, that happens over time as a, um, as a culture or a city evolves organically. I think the temptation in post-traumatic uh, reconstruction efforts would be to kind of hotwire that into a city. Um, 
And um, that's why some, again, yesterday in the panel, some of those discussions about um, having temporary structures in some of the uh, vacant spaces in the city were quite valid as well. Again, that sort of spontaneity and that uh, bit of anarchy admitted in, into the urban design. Um, and uh, there's a, a, a theorist back in Melbourne at RMIT called Quentin Stevens who's written a book called The Ludic City and he um, looks at case studies all around the world so he looks at public art um, monuments, um, reconstructed cities um, and I'll just sort of um, read a quote from him. He says, detailed and extensive international urban case studies show how urban urban spaces are used for play which is defined and discussed using a four-part definition, competition, chance, simulation, and vertigo. Um, and these um, happen in locations where play has been observed, so uh, paths, intersections, thresholds, boundaries, and props. Um, and he was telling me the other day that a lot of the laneways in sort of Christchurch have been lost, and often laneways are where those sort of uh, things happen in um, city spaces. But I think that... Um, in some way, public art can step up, and if public art is done properly, it can inspire all of those sort of emotions that Quentin Stevens is uh, talking about. Um, and I'm just uh, this is a scene. If you've seen the film Planet of the Apes, you'll recognise this uh, scene at the end, where Charlton Heston um, is walking along the beach. He thinks he's on an alien planet. He sees a Statue of Liberty half buried in the sand, and he realises he's actually back on Earth, and he's uh, travelled forward in time. I think this is a really powerful image because it's a kind of uh, reminder of disaster, um, but it has this sort of detachment. He's on an alien planet, but he isn't. He's both inside and outside this disastrous image. Um, and without um, being too flippant about public art in Christchurch, I think that public art, you know, to me, it would be interesting if it embodied um, that sort of uh, kind of ironic detachment. And someone made the suggestion that... Um, um, that perhaps some of the ruins in Christchurch could be preserved in that way. So, for example, the Christchurch Cathedral. Um, the danger is, of course, because things are happening so fast in the CBD and things are being developed at such a rapid pace that um, we don't know if uh, buildings can be preserved or if, um, if, if uh, you know, developers are moving in saying not down these buildings, maybe they can be saved, maybe they can be half-preserved, maybe they can be leased out to artists, as I mentioned before, but the danger is because things are happening so quickly that we don't know if that's um, going to happen. And um, I think Hugh said that someone came from Japan, an earthquake specialist from Japan, and said, you have to slow down. You don't really need to be knocking things down so quickly. Um, and I just want um, to end with um, an observation that, um, again, to reiterate the point that arts can play a part in um, helping to work through these um, scenarios. But we live in times when the arts have been severely devalued. Back in Australia, Tas Tasmania has lost all its arts funding. <clears throat> the ABC has cut its arts division, things like that. Even in the Netherlands, uh, of course, where Rotterdam is, um, they've, cut, they've severely uh, denuded their arts funding as well. Um, hopefully, uh, you know, arts will still be valued in Christchurch post-reconstruction, and it obviously doesn't have an immediate economic benefit, you know, things, as I mentioned, things need to um, evolve organically. And, uh, but what I think the, the value of public art in this context can do is, as I mentioned, sort of work through those sort of traumatic situations um, and to create a kind of, you know, and the best art should, I think, have that element of vertigo as well that Quentin Stevens was talking about, as I mentioned before. So that element of vertigo and danger about it as, as well. Um, uh, and a sort of danger um, that reminds you that this, you know, and we had an earthquake while we were sitting there waiting to talk, which was quite strange, or a, a tremor, a ripple. Um, that danger is always there. So we need public art that can remind us of that danger, but also give us a sort of aesthetic response to us to help us work through it and to uh, move forward. So that's the, I guess that's the pr productive dystopia that can help us move forward to a sort of, uh, if you like, more utopian way of uh, viewing the city. Thank you. To the next part of the, um, the session today, which is um, a discussion among the panellists on a few questions, um, a few topics of interest. 
Um, I thought we might start by talking about some of the current problems with public art and urban planning. If we want to imagine a different future, I think we've got to have a look at the current scenario and look at whether that's working or not. Um, it seems to me that some of public art's great successes are when public art is actually integrated into urban planning right from the start. We're really bad at this in New Zealand. We're terrible at it. We build urban spaces we, or we design them. In fact, we might get right through to building them. And then somebody says, crap, there's no art in it. We need some art. And some money comes from somewhere and a commission, whatever, is established, and a piece of artwork is made and plops into a space, just there, the art place in the urban plaza. And that's all very well, and we've got some fantastic works in the country that are a result of that process. But it always feels a bit substandard to me. And I think um, the re some of the really great works of art are where they're integrated into urban design from the start. Martin Creed's new steps in Edinburgh, um, where he's actually made... Um, designed the physical steps that people walk on as an artwork, a very practical one. That's a great example. Why don't we, why aren't we better at integrating art into urban planning? How might we do that better in the future? And I thought I might put that one um, initially to Bill and Hugh. Why are we no good at it? I think, <clears throat> I think it's a two-way discussion, actually. Um, um, on the one hand, I think about you know, Martin Creed, you know, designing steps, and all of a sudden I'm thinking about goodness, you know, the steps have to, you know, have to be certain sizes. They're specified in the Building Act. The, 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 it has to have handrails. It has to, um, you know, you have to have ramps to get disabled access. I mean, there's all sorts of other problems. Now, that's not a reason for not doing it, but but the artist who does it has to be prepared to step up and actually to deal with all these other issues. They're real issues. People need to get access. It needs to be safe. Um, and, and they have to hold on to their vision through that while they do it. And that's a, that's a, that's a, it's a, it's a real, that's a step up, you know, it's a, you know, it's a hard, you have to be a good artist to be able to do that. You know, it's not enough just to say, oh, well, that's, you know, it's not in my artistic vision, you know, go away. <laughs> that's not, you know, they ha in terms of dealing with an urban environment, you have to respect the things that are going on around you. You have to realise there'll be a sign on the building, you know, you know above the, the door. It, it's, you're not in control of the whole thing. You're a collaborator. You're, you're dealing with a whole kind of range. And, hope, and, 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 and I guess um, it's also a challenge that I think we'd like, um, you know, we should be including more artists at that level. Um, so it's a challenge to, 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 to local authorities and people who are running those projects to get artists involved and give them the opportunity to do that. It's a two-way, both sides, I think, need to shift. And, you know, if I could see something mm. changing, I'd like to, to see that, you mm. know. Um, it has to happen at the right level. It has to happen at the kind of level where they're building things. I don't, you know, for example, I don't know. I don't think artists want to be involved in writing strategies or, you know, developing programs. I think they want to be involved in building things, maybe. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, <coughs> I can hear a little bit of feedback. But um, <coughs> um, I, th I think the, the big danger that we've got here is that it's, you know, this perception of crisis and that, um, unfortunately, we live in New Zealand, and one of the things that we're very good at getting rid of in a crisis is good design and good architecture and good art and that sort of thing. I think we've got to wrap it in much more fundamentally at the beginning of the whole process, rather than seeing kind of good design as an add-on. And unfortunately, I come from the world of architecture, of course, and architects um, very frequently have their hands tied, and you get this kind of like dumbing down of everything, and architects do need a whole lot of help um, from the very start of the whole process. And I think a, another good way of, um, of getting that mechanism going is um, the um, ur urban design panel and attacking it at that point rather than letting developers run the show, rather than letting the sense of uh, urgency continue. So mm. It is urgent that you know, Christchurch gets back up on its feet, but you don't want it to, turning into Hamilton. <laughs> <laughs> no, we don't. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> um, in terms of that, in terms of what you're talking about, Bill, with compromise and architecture, which um, I understand from architect friends is an inherent part of the practice of architecture, is disappointment and compromise um, from the initial imaginative idea into what's actually resolved. 
Um, I was reading architectural critic Jean-Louis Cohen recently on the, what he called the slow, sterile process of rebuilding Ground Zero in New York City. And he put this down to the negative effect of capitalism, the forces of capitalism, on the power of the imagination. Projects that are conceived to be utopian, to be con you know, conceived as a wonderful imaginary future, which in the realisation are paired back and compromised again and again. I'll put that to the panel. I mean, are we likely to see the same sort of breaks on imagination in the future in Christchurch caused by um, the various compromises that capitalism and um, multiple ownership of sites, you know, requirement of um, capital investors to um, have a return on their investment, not to wait, meanwhile, while Christchurch gets back on its feet, but actually to have a return now on the investment. Are we likely to see breaks on the imagination caused by the flows of capital in the city? What do people think? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> mm. oh, there's mm. huge, there are huge risks for Christchurch at the moment with the flight of capital and, you know, and insurance companies paying out money to invest in other places, you know, now. Um, but I, I guess I'd like to turn it around. I, look, we, are, we would expect that if Christchurch is rebuilt successfully, you know, for every dollar that the public sector invests, we'll, we'll see seven, eight, nine dollars invested by the private sector. That's a good thing. I just think we have to change our headspace around if we kind of... I don't think we can decry the capitalists. We shouldn't let the capitalists, you know, do what they want, but they are... The, they will rebuild the city, you know, really. The council's not going to do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it's not the council's job. It's not, you know... Uh, we, it's, we live in a, a country where private investors, you know, make cities. And they make... Yeah, hopefully they make great cities. They can make bad cities too. It's more in the way that we... Um, we work with them, and I guess I'd like to think that we get ourselves into a position where we encourage people to invest and we support them and we enable it, but not at any cost. You have to do it well, and it has to work for the city as well as for the private developer. And I think that's the difference. You know, We're not just letting them do what they want. It's about working with them to try and get an outcome that works. And I guess I don't think compromise... I, I've talked about the art of compromise before. I don't... I have to not see it as a bad thing. You know, I think a good compromise is one that meets the core objectives of both parties. Cities are, you know, inherently they compromise. There are so many people doing different things and they have to be about compromise and it's about um, recognising that sometimes the sum of all those parts, you know, the sum of all those compromises is greater than one person getting their way and doing exactly what they want, from, from my perspective. So I don't, you know, I think it's about the art of compromise and about ensuring that we don't just simply roll over and give them people, you know, whatever they want. We look after the public at the same time as we look after private investment. But it's not, it's not just the big businesses and that sort of thing as well. One of the things that you notice about Auckland is how difficult it is for young people to get started. And one of the beautiful things about Wellington and Christchurch and Dunedin is this historic background of older buildings in which uh, young people can kind of set up and operate any kind of business, the arts, you know, you name it. Mm. It is very difficult to do that in Auckland after that economic cyclone that economic earthquake of the 1980s bowled everything over down there. And you just end up with kind of like uh, big box developments, malls, uh, glass high rises, that sort of thing. And there are just, there's, there's no niches, there's no environment for kind of like um, pe people to start operating at all levels that the city requires. So I am, I am weary about this. Um, this, uh, you know, let the developers lead the way thing. And I think we need those mechanisms in there, such as an urban design panel, and we need to get um, quality of design and art involved in there early. Mm. Uh, if, if we do leave it to the developers um, and, um, you know, the, the, the big chains and that sort of thing, it will end up being an add-on all the time. Mm. Just, um, just to add to that, I'm actually on the Christchurch Urban Design Panel. And, I mean, it's very... Oh, actually, I can think of one project which had a bit of an art component to it. Um, but, um, I, you know, the Urban Design Panel does a great job and it's a really great initiative. I think one of the things, though, is the Urban Design Panel as an organisation needs teeth. And one of the things, and I, you know, I, is the new central city plan. There's a whole range of assessment matters for new buildings and so forth. And, 
really one of the ideas that came to my mind was that you know, maybe some of those assessment matters should be to do with art. And if they're there, then the Urban Design Panel actually has some teeth to, to try and influence things more. Mm. Yeah. I mean, one of the ways that um, the developers have been influenced um, in a positive sense to invest in public art is the Percent for Art Scheme, which has operated in a number of countries, including New Zealand in the past. Um, there are several public works of art in Wellington that are a result of Percent for Art, including um, the Bill Colbert and Ralph Hotary Fault work on the outside of City Gallery, that beautiful light work. Um, that's, that's a Percent for Art project um, from the early 90s. And um, the, the whole, I mean, everybody knows what the Percent for Art scheme is, do they? It's, um, it's where a levy is put on um, the capital costs of a big development project, a, a mall, a building, whatever, um, for public art. So that might be half a percent of the total cost of the project is um, put into making a public work of art in the public space around the building. Um, there's mixed success with these schemes um, around the world. In some um, places, you know, anybody can call themselves an artist, so there's absolutely heinous art that's been produced as a result of this. Interior design art, horrible engineering art, this kind of thing. Not, you know, proper art at all. Um, so that's, that's been a problem of the Percent for Art scheme. But it has resulted in fantastic works. What do the panel think about the idea of a Percent for Art scheme in Christchurch? Um, I'd be interested to hear from Ash, actually, too, in terms of um, how an artist would um, engage with a project like that, with a scheme like that, um, whether you think it's a good thing or whether you prefer things to happen in a different, more organic way. Um, yeah, well, I, I mean, obviously, if there's going to be inevitable um, big-scale development um, and developers running the future of this city then I think that, um, well, that's that's the pessimistic sort of look, I guess, into the future of the rebuild of Christchurch. Then I think that that um, model certainly has to be incorporated into the to the, the future of, of building this city, especially if there is going to be a creative uh, stronghold, I guess, on, on, on where it goes. And But as you mentioned, I, I guess it doesn't necessarily always work, and in Melbourne that exist but it doesn't necessarily work and often the real artists aren't the people that are getting those opportunities to propose for those projects and also they are more um, permanent um, uh, permanent based works as opposed to um, short or long term ephemeral based projects and I think in respect to the conversations that have been had with the temporary architecture moving forward I think it's, uh, it, it cannot be separated to the, to the need for temporary art moving forward and also temporary art being considered for these percentage schemes if that goes ahead as opposed to the generic um, or the unimaginative ways that, that, that developers um, uh, undertake these initiatives. And I think that's something that all, all parts of the creative community in Christchurch need to think about, including SCAPE, with respect to um, to their permanent um, sculpture initiatives. And I think that um, while it has um, worked in the past, leading into the earthquake, I don't necessarily think that um, that, that large scale permanent works are the the way forward now for SCAPE or for the for the council. And I think that. Um, I think that there needs to be uh, not just you know um, the existing panels that, that that exist creatively in Christchurch, but also a lot of um, I guess renegade panels being set up that are completely cross cross uh, creative initiatives, be it leading architects, visual artists, um, um, uh, you know landscape designers, what have you, but. But really rethinking, I guess, the way forward for this city. And I certainly think that the amount of gap sites is just going to be, um, I guess, outrageous. And like once it, once the city really opens up, and 
there'll be a, there'll be a huge amount of wall space, and so I think that um, sculpture isn't necessarily um, the art of the future of Christchurch. Possibly bringing in site-specific um, artists from around um, uh, New Zealand and. Australia and internationally that work uh, in a two-dimensional um, realm but in public space, um, thinking about walls that, are, that, are, that have been um, opened up, I guess, by the, the, the new city. But, but certainly just uh, a constant reimagining, I guess, of, of an importance and actually artists and everyone in the creative community being authoritative about what art should be to the power makers that are ignorant to what art should be. It's, I mean, it's quite similar, I guess, to, to educating people in respect to who I am as a contemporary artist. People outside of, of, of the known fields of art, you know, just think, I'm a, you know, artists should be a, a painter or, or what have you, all the, all the stuff that... Um, you know, fits in with, I guess, what a, a commissioned sculpture should be. But um... um, Ash makes a, a good point. There's probably two issues. Uh, one is the new, the new building. What do we do there? Um, and there are plenty of examples from the 1950s of art integrated with architecture in which um, you get a big box with a bit of chewed up bubble gum on the front of it, which is the artwork. Mm. Um, but the other approach that Ash has been talking about is the importance of maybe um, escape becomes much more important as part of a rolling temporary program that's kind of filling the gaps because this city is going to look like it's had its teeth kicked out for a decade mm. or two to come. And there's a real need for a much bigger kind of like push in the way of a public art that's perhaps not the traditional notion of public art but can deal with these spaces in the city. Mm. Because we're going to be in a transitional city for some years to come, aren't we? Yeah. And we're going to need mm. public mm. works that yeah. respond imaginatively to mm. that period of transition yeah. rather than permanent works where because we don't know mm. what, the, what the future holds in fact, yeah. do we? So, 